Excellent.
see all of you here this morning. I'm Pastor Robin. Pastor here at Brandon Community United Methodist Church. Good to have you here this morning with us in worship. Thank you observing the protocol, for observing the protocols and wearing masks and um, social distancing. We're going to get through this, right? Yes. There is a post-pandemic life, right? Yes. Amen. Yeah, we're headed there. How many have had their shots already? One, two, three, four. This is fabulous, and we have people that are coming back as a result of getting the vaccinations as well. Uh, hello in Facebook land. Welcome all of you. Uh, a quick word about our recording today in Facebook. The uh, service is being streamed by our new camera. <laughs> The Ad Council is happy about that, after the money we spent. And so, thank you, Wayne. Let's give Wayne a hand for all the work that he has done in helping us uh, get this going and keeping Bill from uh, taking over back there right now. Uh, so, we're really glad that it's uh, being streamed on the new camera. And we've gotten feedback from people about audio and the screen and reading and so forth, but uh, your audio should be good. If it's not, maybe buy a small set of speakers for your computer because the audio coming out should be good, either with the phone or with this camera. So I want to mention a couple of things about uh, what's going on at RIM. We have, as you know, next Saturday. What's next Saturday? Anybody know? Making burritos. One more time. Making burritos. Making burritos for Super Bowl Sunday. And Rusty's going to share the sign-up sheet with us and uh, say a couple of words. He's ringleading the uh, effort. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, just a quick update. We're letting everybody know that uh, we're getting the. Uh, Good number of volunteers signed up on the, the volunteer list. We got 20 total so far. The uh, morning uh, cooking is uh, filled, but uh, we can certainly use more volunteers for the afternoon. We can go as quick as we can. And today we've got 318 burritos ordered for the morning. So uh, we're trying to go for a goal of uh, 500. So let us get there. If you want to order more, order more. Go to the link for the uh, through the. Uh, weekly newsletter uh, is a link, and basically all you got to do is just open the link up, uh, fill out your name and your number and your, what you want, and then close it. And that's all you got to do. You also do it here on the paper. You scan, and we'll have this here for us. Thank you. Super Bowl Burrito Sunday, Saturday. Next Saturday, we'll be making burritos. and. Uh, it's a very uh, efficient assembly line. I was part of last year. I got in trouble for putting too much cheese in the burritos. So you have to be very careful. That's why it's not your back. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, yeah. And if you're new here, we have contact cards. Please fill one out if you uh, are new this Sunday. Your information. And if you have a prayer request, contact card. On the back has a prayer request uh, <clears throat> form for you to fill out so we can keep you in our prayers. The Wednesday study is uh, continuing with Denise leading, and you are working on the book of Timothy, right, Denise? That was a surprise for my class to on Wednesday. They don't know that. The class doesn't know that. That was going to be my surprise on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, you tell them by Wednesday. I mean, I got a sneak peek. Okay. Our newcomers group is looking through the, reading through the book of John, and I'm preaching through John uh, this month as well, so you kind of have an idea of what I'm preaching about. The newsletter has that information as well. We're also watching a movie that documents the scripture in the book of John in that class, and the link is on the newsletter site if you want to join and watch that movie, which covers all of the scripture and all of the stories as well. So 
And you can join us for the Zoom meeting. We meet at 9 o'clock next Wednesday. Just let me know and I'll send the link to you as well. We'd like to have as many people as would like to come. Okay, any other announcements that uh, we need to cover this morning? Anything we missed? If not, then let us move forward. We have a, a new song. Well, I think we, some of us know this, Laura, I want to be a Christian. And you know, we have been singing quite a few new songs at church, and I know some of you would rather hear the traditional music, but Matt and I were talking this morning, and he, he reminded me that every song that you know, you had to learn sometime. <laughs> So, so it, and it is fun to learn new songs, and we try to do the new song every couple for a couple of weeks. So let us all join in singing uh, our Lord, I want to be a Christian.
What would, did Miss Sharon, she always wore hats, right? Goofy hats. Remember when she'd come in in goofy hats? They were funny, right? So I think Miss Sharon's probably watching at home on Facebook. And I think in her honor, we should all wear a goofy hat. What do you say? Okay. All right. This one was on it. Okay. You guys, I don't have too many goofy hats. Everybody take a hat. I think this one goes. You haven't? Well, you've heard it now. You've heard it, okay. So, we're gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and I'm gonna give you two choices of how to react or what to say. And you tell me, what would Jesus do? Okay, which one of the two choices? Okay, what if you were playing out the yard with your friend, John Aaron. And somebody looked at him, somebody come along, and they said, you're fat. You're fat. You shouldn't be fat. Yeah? Okay, here's your two choices. What do you do? Do you agree? And you say, yeah, John Eric, you're fat. You, you're too fat. Or do you say, no, he's not. He's just right. Quit picking on him. Okay? So what would Jesus say? That's okay. He's just right. That's right. That's right. Is that the right answer? Perfect. You stood up for your friend, right? Okay. What if they looked at him and said, your hair's too curly. See all those curls? Your hair's too curly. It's ugly. I don't like the color. Now, what would Jesus do? Would he say? Yeah, it should be red. I like red hair. It should be red hair. Or would he say, No, that's who John Eric is. It looks good. Which one? Graham, you answer this one. Say it louder. No, he looks fine. Perfect. And what made you say that? What if somebody said that to you? Would you would you want somebody to say, I don't like your hair, or you're too fat, or you're ugly, or you're dumb? You wouldn't like that, would you? So we wouldn't say it to somebody else because we don't want to hurt their feelings. And we wouldn't want to let somebody else talk to our friend that way, or even a stranger that way. That's okay, she can take it off if she wants. 
Oh, I'm so glad that was my, my mother's hat fits you, Lily. I'm so glad. <laughs> All right, so the, the lesson is we need to think and do what we think is right. What, we've been learning in Sunday school what Jesus did and what he says and how he wants us to live, right? So we need to put that into practice. We need to pay attention to it, and we need to try to live that way, right? Okay, let's say a little prayer. Dear God, Dear God help me to do, help me to do what, Jesus would do. what Jesus would do. I won't always make the right choice, but I will try. Because we love everybody. Uh, uh, quite a lengthy period of time and he is uh, 
in need of our prayer at this time, so I want to add Bryce to our prayer list as well. Anyone else that like, would like us to lift up someone in prayer this morning, aside from all those we have listed here on our prayer list? <clears throat> and on the back of the prayer list is a, um, a request that you can fill out and give to us if you have a need that you'd like us to pray for. Okay, let's join in prayer this morning as we consider all of the needs of those in our community and our larger community as well. Lord and Heavenly Father, we lift up all those mentioned in our prayer list this morning, the many folks here who are in need of our prayer support. As we read down this list, we recognize the names and lift them up one by one to your care, your love, your healing, hope, and recovery. And for those we mentioned this morning also for Sharon and her continued recovery for her family and all those here who are caring for her in this time of uh, difficulty, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We lift up Bryce as well and as he is in recovery, uh, his time of need for continued support and prayer for this difficult addiction that he faces in alcoholism, we pray that you give him the community and support that he needs, that will give him the strength to go on and lean on you as he continues his recovery. Lord, in your mercy. And for all those things that we have not mentioned out loud, Lord, we, we offer them up to you right now in this moment of silence. <clears throat> Jesus, the one true leader of every church, we choose to stand as one church, your church, and to lift our focus from our differences and divides. We leave our own ways and follow you together. We support each other as we seek to be your disciples in this life. We work together to focus on serving once more, for we must act justly love mercy, and walk humbly together before you and each other. For the sake of our worship of you, our love for each other in the future, and freedom of all those who still live in poverty. Lord Jesus, we ask your Spirit to help us with this, for we are quick to focus on ourselves, our labels, and our differences rather than our common bonds and shared destiny. Christ have mercy in your precious name which unites us all. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power of the Amen. Now let us join in singing, Precious Lord, take my <coughs>
Our first reading today comes from 1 Corinthians, chapter, 17, ver, chapter 3, verse 17. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Chapter 6, verse 19. Or did you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? From the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then Jesus said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, and his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Suzanne. I forgot to mention on our prayers that we, we had a service here for Tom Wren yesterday, and some of you were there, and we want to keep them in our prayers, Linda and her family, uh, as they continue to grieve this loss. The uh, family, well, many of them were here from Minnesota, so it was uh, a very good send-off that we gave Tom. I also want to mention, I was noticing some folks over there here on the right-hand side I haven't seen in a long time. Let's see, is he noticing anybody new? Yes. Ron and Eileen are here. <laughs> Woo! Can you remember what last Sunday you were here? What month it was? Was it? Not that one. I remember. April or May? No, I had surgery. It was probably February. February. <clears throat> Almost a year ago. <clears throat> How does it feel to be back? Good. Good. Well, we're really glad you're back. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, as people do continue to return uh, back to church, we want to welcome everyone that hasn't been here for so long. So the sermon is uh, a continuation of the discussion from the book of John. And I'm preaching out of chapter 2 this morning, uh, the section on the cleansing of the temple. And I want to just start by recognizing that it is pretty clear to us that the temple for us is, is here. The temple of God for us, it's not a place out here. It's not this church. It's not the beauty of the mountains. It's in here. And so the cleansing, the cleaning and the clearing out of what isn't quite right takes place in here. The message today is about our hearts and being accountable for our actions. Being willing to have God cleanse our hearts again, that we might walk upright and with a sense of confidence in God. The scripture, in the scripture, Jesus went to the temple, and in, in John, he goes to the temple three times. In the other gospels, it's only once. And the cleansing happens in the front of John versus toward the end in the other gospels. And he goes into the temple, and I have a picture of the temple grounds here just to show you if you can see this. It's a rather large facility, about four, four football fields in size, something like that, maybe larger. And you see the big area on the outside, which is the Gentiles area. 
And then the next inside area is the, uh, the area for women. And then the next inner area is for men and then sacrifices and priests. And then you see the tall building in the center where the Holy of Holies is, where they light incense. And the high priest goes in once a year on the day of atonement. <clears throat> so what's going on in, in Jesus' visit to the temple here is he's in the, in the court of the Gentiles, the outer area, which is fairly large, and that's where they're vending animals and selling sacrificial products and the like. Okay, I wanted to just give you uh, today's version of this site, so keep this in mind. Go to the next slide, and you will see today's Jerusalem, or in the Hebrew, Yerushalayim, and you see, it doesn't look quite the same. In fact, it's a very different place. The landscape is the same, but in the middle you see the dome, the gold dome, that is the dome of the rock. It is a Muslim, uh, it is it Islamic dome, sacred place. And that is where the temple, part of the temple was in the first century. And that is the temple grounds area. What you see around it in the walls is a crusader wall structure built in medieval times. And the only remaining part of <clears throat> Herod's temple, which is what we're talking about, is in the lower left-hand side here, which is called the Wailing Wall, where Jewish people go to uh, worship, <clears throat> which is the wall uh, along... The, it's in the shadows here along the bottom, tall, and that's a, what's remaining. And since my visit there in 1972, <clears throat> archaeologists have excavated all of this area down here along the right-hand corner, which it is ancient uh, excavations from the first century and even earlier. On the right-hand side, you see a valley, which is uh, the Mount of Olives is on the other side of it. The Garden of Gethsemane is down there as well. So this gives you a feeling of the geographic location we're talking about. And the main old city is all this on the left, where um, people live still. And uh, it is a bustling city, and the wall continues on. And it is quite a historic and an amazing place. So Jesus goes into the court of the Gentiles and he's angry because he sees them vending and selling animals and sacrificial offerings. And uh, he's voicing his anger because there is a lack of accountability to God. What they're doing is, is not really reflecting what God's temple should be about, which is worship and prayer. He's voicing his anger, his anger because the sacrificial system is actually hurting people. It's enslaving them, in fact. He was there to voice, to be a voice of justice, convicting a corrupt religious system and its leaders, crying out for those who had no voice excuse me, and for those who were afraid to speak out. He brought into the light what people probably had been feeling and saying all along. He revealed to everyone who was watching him with this lash, uh, chasing the moneylenders out and of turning their tables and releasing the animals, how God was being used to build power and privilege for the few at the top, basically. He gave these Jewish leaders a chance to hear the truth and change their ways. And this is what accountability is about. He's calling them to be accountable. He's saying, do not make God's house a den of thieves or a den of robbers or a marketplace. And hearing the truth and getting right with God is the opportunity that they have, no matter what the cost, no matter what it takes. In this case, even the destruction of the temple 
itself would not be too much in order for them to make things right with God. Now, I don't know if you're following along, but I, I mentioned an app you can follow along in the Bible app. And if you want, you can turn to that right now, chapter 2, verse 13 on. In the story, Jews from all around the world have come for the Passover celebration. I mean, this is a big deal. They've come from all over the world for the annual festival, a time of excitement, of celebration, of worship, of reunion. And the temple grounds would be very, very busy at that time. And the area we're talking about of the court of the Gentiles is where they would be selling these animals. And I probably should clarify a couple of things about the way the culture worked and the religion worked at the time. People were understanding that their relationship to God was partly determined by the fulfillment of their sacrificial offerings. The sacrificial offering, or in the Hebrew, korban, had a spiritual meaning and refers to some part of ourselves, maybe our egos, which is given up as a sacrifice to God. The root of the Hebrew word korban was to draw closer to God through the sacrifice of an animal. So there were many different offerings, just to help you see a better, bigger picture, offerings for sins committed, tax, tax, temple tax, there were offerings for regular weekdays, offerings for the Sabbath, offerings for many of the Jewish holidays. Women had their own offerings and requirements for offerings, including an offering after childbirth, an offering after the healing from illness, a Passover sacrifice, an offering of sins committed. You see where I'm going? It becomes quite a lengthy list. Women could even voluntarily participate in other offerings like the first fruits, the temple tax, and peace offerings, and so forth. And they could even, uh, actually, they were allowed to slaughter their own animals themselves if they wished. I'm not, I'm glad they, they included that option. But, uh, <clears throat> so you can see how the religious sacrificial system could become a form of enslavement. And they kept records. There was a lot of social pressure to comply. And when Jesus challenges the sacrificial system, he's saying this is wrong. He challenges the view that one's relationship to God was determined by one's ability to give. He told them to stop using religion to exploit people. God was about prayer, not profit. He says to them, stop making my father's house a market. In Matthew, it says, den of thieves or robbers, because they were stealing from the people. Their tradition and religion were out of line. And they said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? By what authority, essentially, are you acting in this way? Help us understand, because... We have the backing of our tradition and our religion and our leaders. They were wondering what was wrong with what they were doing. You know, they might have even gone back afterwards and talked to their leaders about this. Who knows? We don't see it in John. He doesn't go further in talking about it. But judging from his other encounters with Jewish leaders, they were not voluntarily going to make these changes because they couldn't see anything wrong with what they were doing, or possibly they refused to see anything wrong with it. You're probably familiar with the, uh, a man named General Colin Powell, who was <coughs> a leader in, in the American government some years ago. He said this, being responsible sometimes means making people mad. Jesus made people mad, and they attacked him. Instead of being accountable, they blamed him. It's a common pattern in human behavior. 
people who are not proud of what they have done tend to deflect the situation. It helps them keep to keep ignoring the real issue behind what they're doing. People would rather play victim and throw a pity party often than, than to learn from their mistakes and grow. Or instead they surround themselves with people who enable their behavior and also blame other people for that person's activity. People generally or often want the easy way out. It's easier to blame another person than to face the demons in our own closets. To face the issues would require dedication and work on ourselves. It's true of these Jewish leaders at the time, and it's true of us today. It's hard to look inside and examine ourselves. It's hard to look at dishonesty that might be there. But look what happened to them. Seventy years later, the Roman legions marched into Jerusalem and systematically destroyed it over a period of weeks. And with it <clears throat> was the end of the Jewish worship traditions. It was the end of the Jewish people in Israel and Jerusalem. The men mostly were killed or sent to the arena. The women were enslaved. And all of the valuables were taken away. To be accountable. To be accountable means that we're willing to be responsible to another person for our behavior, which implies a level of submission to their opinions and viewpoints. Without people to hold us accountable for our actions, we can quickly lose our balance in life and begin to think that there's nothing wrong with the behavior that actually might be unacceptable. Accountability to one's spouse is an essential to any successful marriage, I'm sure you probably would agree, in partnership, my willingness to be responsible to Claire, my wife, ensures that we're able to work through disagreements or misunderstandings. And sometimes my own thinking, I can see nothing wrong with something I've done until my wife tells me and holds me accountable. There's a saying, it goes, behind every angry woman is a man who has absolutely no idea what he did wrong. <laughs> Sometimes it's true, I admit. An inspirational speaker, Saida Adala, says, the worst thing that can happen to you in this life is to refuse to be accountable. You refuse to be accountable when you believe that someone else should take responsibility for your life and circumstances. It is true. Years ago, I had a friend who was struggling with alcohol. He didn't think he was an alcoholic but couldn't stop drinking. <clears throat> one night, he was driving home after one too many drinks, and he, he ran a red light and ran smack into a minivan with a family in it. And many of them, or two of them, were seriously injured. He was taken to the detox and then, of course, to court. He was held accountable for his actions, that he was unwilling to take responsibility up until that time. He learned about accountability the hard way. There wasn't any, anything unusual about him. He had a regular work life, marriage, he just had come to believe things about himself that were not true. Do you believe things about yourself that are not true? I guess we have to put that to the test. How do you know? The only way we know is through being accountable to someone else and to God. 
And I'm not talking about someone who enables our behavior or, or just agrees with us, because you know that's not the same thing. I'm talking about someone who will tell you the truth when you and I don't want to hear it. I have two accountability partners, not including Claire, my wife. These two guys in my life will tell me the truth no matter what, and I can count on them. When I don't want to hear something, but they will say it. I rely on them to tell me the hard things, the hard things that, that I don't want to hear, but I must hear. George Washington Carver wrote, 99% of all failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. And you and I don't want to be in that category. We'd rather be accountable and walk a straight line and live with integrity in our lives and in our faith. Because when we make excuses for our failures and our inadequacies, we need to be shown the truth by someone we can trust. <clears throat> like an accountability partner. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but it's, it's a common term for a partnership where two people are accountable to one another in deep friendship, no matter what is going on. Someone you trust and someone who trusts you. It's someone who you, you can tell the truth, you can tell everything, and I mean, everything without fear of rejection. The Methodist church system, just thinking about church life, is a system of accountability. From the administrative council, our church leaders, up to the annual conference and then the general conference, the worldwide organization. Yeah, it's a little bureaucratic, <laughs> but it's a wonderful system of accountability that really does work. It works because people are held accountable at all levels of church life. And the benefit of accountability is the belonging, the safety, and the trust, and the togetherness that we experience here as a result. I love the Methodist Church for these reasons and more. It gives us a place to practice and develop accountability to one another. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? As I said in the beginning of the message, this is the temple here. And so the cleansing, the cleaning, the clearing out of what doesn't belong there, of distorted thinking or woundedness. This is where the work needs to be done. We make ourselves accountable here by revealing ourselves to that person we trust, by being willing to have God cleanse the heart one more time. A man was saying a prayer when God interrupted him and asked him how it was with his soul. <clears throat> The man said, fine, just great, God. And God responded, I'm glad to hear that, but can you give me a tour of your soul so I can see your, your home, get a more complete picture of what you mean? So the man hesitated a little bit, but he said, yes, okay, come with me. I'll show you around. He took God from room to room, opening the door, showing him where he lived, metaphorically speaking. And as he walked past one door, God asked, what's in there? And the man said, nothing, and just kept walking. As they were walking back by the door, God asked him again, can I see what's inside there? The man hesitated and then opened the door with a tinge of fear at how God would react to what he saw, what was hidden inside. God looked in and then looked back at the man and said, let's go in together. 
I want to be here with you. The man started crying and asked, aren't you going to reject me or punish me? And God responded, no, you see, I knew all along what was inside. I just wanted you to show me. I wanted you to let me see all of you. The heart that is accountable to God beams with light, love for all who come near. It blesses each and every person nearby. It lifts the spirits, calms the soul, it summons our courage and quickens our imagination. We all desire to be accountable as we desire to be known. It's just that it can be a little risky to let others really know us. We risk rejection, we risk maybe punishment. But we, when we find the courage to share ourselves in a deep way with God and with that accountability partner, we find a feeling of liberation just pours out. My wish for you, my friends, for this day and this week is to claim your accountability to God and those you love. And I've listed four affirmations that I'd like Wayne to turn to now as I read them. There are four of them I would like you to consider this day. I will honestly confess to God my need for accountability. I will find someone I can be accountable to, to strengthen my accountability relationships. Three, I will take accountability for my actions this week. I will be accountable for my actions this week. And finally, four, I will not blame anyone this week for anything. Join me in prayer. God, our hearts and minds, give us the courage to be honest. Give us the courage to go with you and let you see all of who we are, our hurts, our wounds, our resentments, our guilt and shame. In showing you our souls, we ask for your forgiveness and healing as you renew our hope. So we give others the courage to be open, to be honest, and take responsibility for their actions as well, Lord, to be that witness in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
going and singing, my life goes on. Thank you.